The reading this morning is from John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the dis disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said, No, he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the, ray of the nails on his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, if you believe because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. One of the beautiful, hopeful, spring-like things I saw this morning was um, happened in our kitchen just back here. We have a potluck, as you know, that's happening after the service, and um, we've been doing that every month for about a year now. And uh, sometimes it's been hard to find people to sort of volunteer to, to head that up. But today it was like half the congregation was over there doing something, and people were sharing together and putting up tables and putting food out, and it was this beautiful community. And I just, I know not everybody got to see that this morning, and that was a sign of hope and new life. And I'm so thankful for that. Let us pray. God of doubts, God of wisdom, God of hope, we give thanks for your stories. May they work within us that we might hear new insights, be challenged in new ways, be comforted, feel your presence with us. Amen. Last Sunday, we celebrated Easter in this place with all the sights and sounds. We celebrated with brass and choirs and bells and sang Alleluia. We heard the Easter story told by Mark. We heard about the women arriving to embalm Jesus' body. And we heard about the man who was there telling them that Jesus had been resurrected. And then we heard about the women fleeing from the scene, scared and in shock. We acknowledge that not all of us are ready to sing Alleluia, but that the community sings it for us until we can join in. Today, the story continues from John's perspective. It is still Easter, Easter evening, and the shock of the past days has set in with the disciples. The betrayal and the arrest and the trial and the execution of Jesus has the disciples hidden away and locked in a room. Just a few days before they had celebrated the Passover meal in this room, Jesus had taken the bread and the wine that they were sharing and invited them to remember him and to love one another. 
And now here they are under very different circumstances. There is fear and doubt and confusion and anxiety, very similar to the women who fled earlier in the day. But in this story, Jesus shows up. Peace be with you, he says. And all of those gathered in the room have this extraordinary experience with the risen Christ and all the fear that they felt turns to joy and excitement. But we also hear that for some reason, one of the disciples, Thomas, isn't with them when all of this happens. We don't know why he wasn't there. Maybe he didn't get the memo that they were meeting. Maybe he stopped to get some lunch. Maybe he was hiding out somewhere else. He arrives after everyone has had this mystical and life-changing experience. And when the others try and explain what they, see, what they have seen, Thomas is a bit skeptical. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe, he says. I get Thomas. He has some questions. He wants to experience what the others has, have described, but understandably, he has some reservations. Throughout history, Thomas has been labeled the doubter because of his reaction, but I think he has more of a we'll see kind of attitude. We'll see leaves the possibilities open. We'll see says I'm curious and open. We'll see says it might be possible. I just want to experience it for myself. He's not shutting down the possibility. He just wants to wait and see. The disciples have the benefit of an extraordinary uh, personal experience with the sacred. Most of us don't get that kind of experience. And so we end up being a lot like Thomas, waiting to see, but open to the possibility. And part of waiting and living a spiritual life is asking the questions of our faith, asking the questions of our experiences, and asking the questions of possibility. To me, Thomas is a hopeful figure for all of us who have questions and approach issues of faith with some skepticism and curiosity. Curiosity is an important part of our human experience, and it's a really, really important part of our spirituality. Questioning and examining things that interest us or grab us in some way lead us to deeper questions and deeper insights. We grow when we question because questions lead to more questions and we realize we have even more to learn and to experience. It's true in all sorts of fields, isn't it? I was struck by an article in the New York Times this week because to me, science and spirituality are closely related. Both require big ideas and they require questioning and examining and all of that leads us to new possibilities. And so maybe you saw this article as well. There was an article about the shifting understanding about dark energy, the mysterious force that scientists say is speeding up the expansion of the cosmos. Recent studies are, are pointing to new ways of thinking about this and are leading to more questions. The Times wrote this, that conclusion, if confirmed, could liberate astronomers and the rest of us from a long-standing, grim prediction about the ultimate fate of the universe. If the work of dark energy were constant over time, it would eventually push all the stars and galaxies so far apart that even atoms could be torn asunder, sapping the universe of all life, light, energy, and thought, and condemning it to an everlasting case of the cosmic blahs. Instead, it seems dark energy is capable of changing course and pointing the cosmos toward a richer future. 
The questions led to questions and to new possibilities and conversations. We'll see. Similarly, questions are a part of our biblical tradition. It's how Jesus interacted with people and how he invited them to broaden their worldview. One scholar that I read this week says that the gospel writers record Jesus asking 307 questions. He is asked 187 questions, but he only answers three of them. Faith is less about certainty, but asking and sitting with the complexity of good questions. David Luce, president of the Lutheran Seminary at Philadelphia, writes, true, vigorous, vibrant faith comes from the freedom to question, wonder, and doubt. Thomas comes to faith because he first has the chance to voice his doubt and questions and then experiences Jesus for himself. If you have questions, if you have doubts, if you wonder, you are in good company and you are living a faithful life. We need to be curious about our world and about how we treat one another and about how we might improve things and about how uh, we might ponder meaningful things. The questions stretch us and invite us into more. They might even change our perspectives and what we think might happen. Krista Tippett um, has a podcast called On Being, and it's one of my go-tos for delving into these big ideas. I always think, what is Krista Tippett and, uh, saying about that, and, what, and who is she interviewing? This week, I listened to a number of her interviews with different people on doubt and curiosity. And so if you can, I encourage you, if you're, if you're curious about this, to find her podcast and listen or, or read some of the transcripts because they always uh, invite us into more meaningful reflection and, of course, more questions. She talks about living the questions that in our lives we live these questions, these big questions that we might have as a way of seeing and moving in the world. Curiosity then becomes a spiritual practice and part of who we are and how we move in the world. And so I thought in the spirit of Thomas and all of us who hold this will see posture I want to give us some time this morning to sit with the questions. And so I think Janet has um, some index cards and she's going to pass them out. She, she's already passed them out, okay. And hopefully you have a pencil or a pen or something. And we're just gonna take some time. We'll have a few minutes. And what I'm gonna invite you to do is just to write down a question that, um, about faith or the Bible that you've had. It could be all sorts of things. Anything that you've wondered. And if you're willing, I'll invite you to put the card in the offering plate this morning up here on the table or just set it on the table. If you're online, if you're willing, you can post them in the chat room um, or you can email them to me. And what I'm hoping is all of our questions um, and, and things that we're wondering can inform um, perhaps some future sermon series uh, this summer. Uh, and, and we can get a sense of the questions that we are wondering together. So we'll take a few minutes, maybe three or four minutes, just put, but you can put down more than one question if you'd like, but just a question. And if you're willing, um, during the candle lighting and communion, you can just place it up here on the table. Ethan can play some music while we're doing this. There is Ethan. Thanks, Ethan.
That may have felt like a long time or it may not have felt like any time at all. So if you have questions later and are willing to share them, we'll invite you to put them on the table. If you think of something later that you want to email to me, I'll invite you to do that. Or if you just want to sit in your own question as a, a spiritual practice, um, I invite you to that as well. We need the freedom of doubt and curiosity and questions in our spiritual life. Questions that lead to more questions invite us to grow and to open ourselves up to new possibilities and invite questions and conversation with the sacred and with one another. In this Easter season, we give thanks for people like Thomas who invite us to ask the questions and live the questions and invite us into a life of curiosity and faith. May we be open to all the possibilities this week, to questions that invite us into a deeper life. Amen.